Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for this Sunday morning service. Tusculum Hills Baptist Church is a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16 for the reading this morning, starting with verse, verse 13. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. The title of the message today is Focus on Your Strengths and the Strengths of Others. A lot of times people focus on weaknesses, which really doesn't help much. We need to be aware of weaknesses, as you'll hear me say a couple of times, but we really need to focus on strengths. Now, I don't do many commercials about the Sunday evening service or anything else, usually on Sunday morning, but uh, I do want to invite you back on Sunday night. I'm preaching through the book of Acts. I'll probably incorporate some of that on Sunday morning. Uh, very exciting what happened in the first church after Jesus ascended into heaven and his Holy Spirit came down. So here we are, Matthew chapter 16, starting with verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do you say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And the Greek word there is Petros, which means rock. So your, your translation may say rock. And on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Well, in traveling with his disciples, Jesus simply asked a question, who do you say that I am? But there is some background to this passage, as there is with every passage. Caesarea Philippi was a Greek town that was caught up in the worship of a pagan god called Pan. It was a, a goat god. The pagan worship involved prayers to goats and even immorality with goats. Goats And nearby there was a cave dedicated to the goat god Pan. Now at this time in history, this, this Greek religion, this mythological god and worship of this god was at an all-time high. And so this cave that was nearby that had been dedicated to the goat god Pan had been called by many as the gates of hell, as they believe it led to the underworld. And so Jesus, being the rabbi with his disciples following him, took his disciples where no other rabbi would take his disciples. So he took them to one of the most, if not the most pagan place on earth at that time and pronounced that he was going to build a kingdom that the gates of hell could not penetrate. Well, as we know, Jesus was not your average rabbi. And he built this kingdom with a group of disciples who he mentored and he taught and then he left them to do the work on their own. Now a lot of writing has been done on the Greek word here used for rock, uh, Petros and Petron. This is a very interesting study that I'll uh, definitely bring out to you at another time. But that's not what I'm looking at this morning. Uh, one writer said that Jesus does not simply assign this role to Peter arbitrarily. However, Peter is the rock because in this context, he is the first one who confesses Jesus is the Christ. Well, Peter's weaknesses were obvious. His main one was that he was impulsive. Probably right connected with that was usually his impulsiveness was in his speech. And then right next to that was his impulsiveness related to his action. <clears throat> Look at the front of your bulletin there. You see a nice graphic and a scripture there from Joel. Let the weak say, I am strong. 
And in our weakness, God wants to make us strong. Well, what about Peter's weaknesses and his impulsiveness? Peter stepped out of a boat when he saw Jesus and he walked on water and then he began sinking when he took his eyes off of Jesus. And then one time Peter rebuked Jesus, which is kind of hard to even imagine, but he rebuked Jesus for talking about dying and Jesus swiftly corrected him. And it was Peter who drew his sword and attacked the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. And it was Peter who boasted that he would never forsake the Lord even if everyone else did. And we know that he denied Christ three times. No doubt, Peter was a man like many of us, struggling between our weaknesses and our strengths. Do you ever struggle that way? Am I the only one? <laughs> we've got weaknesses and we've got strengths. Now, the interesting thing about Jesus' relationship with Peter is that Jesus corrected Peter, but he focused on Peter's strengths. In fact, after Jesus ascended into heaven, Peter's strengths helped establish the church in the book of Acts. And in Acts 2 and Acts 3, Peter's the one speaking out and telling people about Jesus. Now, Jesus focused on Peter's strength, which was boldness. He was a bold fellow. How different it would have been if Jesus had focused on Peter's weaknesses. <laughs> what if Jesus had constantly scolded Peter? What if he sent him to remedial training for overcoming his weaknesses? Peter was always aware of his weaknesses, but Jesus focused on his strength. In fact, Jesus focused on the strength of all his disciples. <clears throat> And all the people that he met, Jesus focused on their strengths. Now, let's go back to the Old Testament. God called Moses to be a great leader. And Moses immediately focused on his own weakness. He had a speech impediment. We don't think about that about Moses, do we? Because we've learned to focus on Moses' strength. Imagine God sending Moses to speech therapy before he could be the leader of his people. Or imagine God sending Moses to some type of speech class where he could learn how to speak publicly and learn how to give the basics of public speeches. His brother Aaron was a good speaker. He was a better speaker. And Moses even said, call him. But God focused on Moses' strength, which was what? Leadership. Moses was always aware of his weakness, but... God focused on his strength. Now imagine if we focused on our weaknesses. I think that a lot of people do that. People may focus so much on their weaknesses that they have no opportunity to maximize their strengths. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. Paul writes, and he says that... God said to him, Jesus said to him, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I, bo I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. This is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, the Apostle Paul talked here about relying on the Lord after he asked the Lord to remove the thorn in his side. Paul had physical weaknesses. He had poor eyesight. Uh, he had this thorn in his side that he talks about. We're not sure what that was. Perhaps other weaknesses that Paul had. But he claimed the strength of Christ in spite of his weaknesses. No doubt, Paul played to his strengths. What if Paul had said, Lord, I can't travel because I can't see well. You see, he was aware of his weaknesses. And I want to talk to you about two Roosevelt's. You know who I'm talking about. Theodore and Franklin, both of them great presidents. I decided to choose a Republican and a Democrat so that I wouldn't get in trouble this morning. But I believe most people would say that because of Teddy Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt, our country is a better country and our world is a better place. 
Did you know, though, as a child, Teddy Roosevelt was terribly puny? He was a sickly child. His parents didn't even know if he was going to live. He was a weakling. And as he grew older, he realized how weak he was compared to other children. And he started working out and he started reading to become smarter. And he grew to be a robust man. But all of his life, he continued to d deal with health problems. Now, what if he had focused on his health problems and didn't think he was fit to be president? <laughs> See, he was well aware of his weaknesses, but he focused on his strength. And then later on, Franklin Roosevelt, at age 39, became sick with what many believe was polio, but some doctors today are saying it, maybe it was something else. But one encyclopedia said this about Franklin Roosevelt's terrible, debilitating illness. His paralysis affected both sides of his body evenly. He had partial facial paralysis early on, numbness, extreme prolonged pain, and bladder and bowel dysfunction. Yet he was president of the United States at the most crucial time in American history that many would argue. Well, what if this Roosevelt also said, I'm too sick to be president? You see, he was well aware of his weaknesses but he focused on his strength. Now my, my idea here about focusing on strength is backed up with research. There is a book called Go Put Your Strengths to Work and it's written by a man named Marcus Buckingham. This author surveyed people in the United States, Canada, Western Europe, and Japan, I believe, developed countries that are known for productivity. And one of the questions that he asked people was whether they should spend the majority of their time. Now listen, I want you to hear this. He asked people if they thought they should spend the majority of their time trying to improve their weaknesses or if they should play to their strengths with the majority of their time. Now, the vast majority, I think it was something like 80% of the people in all these countries. And the interesting thing is I heard him speak and I saw his slideshow every country answered almost on the same percentage, about 80%, as I recall, of the respondents said that they should spend the majority of their time trying to improve their weaknesses. There was a small minority, about 20%, that said that they should spend their time playing to their strengths and maximizing their strengths. Well, guess what? Those 20% are the people with the top jobs in the country and government leaders. And that 20% also responded that they were more satisfied in life than those who said they should spend the, the majority of their time focusing on improving their weaknesses. That is really an incredible study. Now, when I was in the sixth grade, all sixth graders went to the gym one day for an impromptu assembly. We didn't know what it was about. The band director from the junior high and high school, one, one band director taught band in both schools. He brought students to play instruments for us in elementary school. And their, their brief presentation inspired some of us to join the band. Now, this band director was visionary. He came to a sleepy country town that only believed in sports. And he motivated the town to get new uniforms, new equipment. And he was only there three years or so, but his impact was so strong on that town that in a few years, this little band in this sleepy town went on to be state champions. There was no doubt that he loved what he did. He left. I lost track of him. Many years passed. And then recently, I reconnected with him on Facebook. There's his picture. There he is conducting a band. And he'd been the band director at Virginia Tech since 1984. 30 years he's been there. Now, a year and a half ago, I was driving through Virginia. And I decided to contact him. He said, hey, tonight is a Virginia Tech game. And he invited me to come to that game. And he got tickets for me right at the end zone in the standing room only area. He invited me to spend the night at his house. It just so happens that game was on ESPN that night. We, we all want our 15 minutes of fame, right? Well, 
I had 1.5 seconds of fame as I was jumping up and down by the goalpost. I called the family to look for me on TV and they saw me, so that was my 1.5 seconds of fame. But uh, after the game, I went to Mr. McKee's house and I listened while he and his wife reflected on their careers and their love of music. And both of them are no doubt dedicated public servants. Now, as he was talking to me, in the back of my mind was the fact that my job was going to run out in about a year and I was contemplating the future. And Mr. McKee began talking about years earlier when he left the music world to sell insurance. And he talked about how unhappy he was in that career field. He called his dad one day to talk. He told his dad that he wasn't happy and his, his dad said something abruptly, you're not doing what you love doing and he hung up the phone. The conversation was something like that. So in spite of the financial challenges of a growing family, he went back doing what he loved doing. And soon after that, he went to Virginia Tech where now he's been for 30 years and he has turned the marching Virginians into a benevolent outreach. It's not just a band of 300 or so people. Uh, his band does large benevolent projects. They do disaster relief. They fix homes for the elderly. They do food drives. And he talked about how it's not really about the band. It's about inspiring a group of people together to help others. Now, Keep in mind that I, I'm sitting here just soaking this in and I was so inspired listening to him. I was trying to figure a way to come to pastor in Virginia so I could join the band and play cymbals or something like that. But as I sat there at, at his home that night listening to him talk about what he loved doing and as I listened to his wife talking about what she loves doing with music with uh, young students. I realized that both of these two were happy in part because they maximized their strengths. And I realized right there that the Lord was speaking to me indirectly from this teacher from long ago. And so the next morning on my drive back to Mount Juliet from Blacksburg, I reflected on that conversation, do what you love doing. And I made a commitment to the Lord that I would spend the rest of my life doing what I love doing. I knew a man who hated his job. He was frustrated at work and he took out his frustration on other people. Uh, he became a leader in the church and he brought all of his anger and his baggage about his job to church and just took it out on everybody in the ugliest way. Now, we might dislike our jobs every now and then, that's part of it. We might dislike the people that we are around every now and then, that's part of it. But what a pity to spend an entire career doing something that you hate. What a waste. I wanna ask you this, what is it that you love doing? What is it? And here's my second question. Have you put that to work for the Lord? Have you? You see, most of us have a very limited view of ministry. We think ministry is what the preacher does. We think that participating in ministry is attending the worship service. We think that it's singing and listening to the preaching, and that's part of it. But listen to me, the ministry is more than that. You will hear me say this over and over until somebody will probably stand up, give the time out sign, that my role as your pastor is to equip you for ministry. Every Christian needs a ministry. And in that ministry, it needs to be something that you love doing. Something you love doing. Ministry is meeting needs. And I want all of you to think about what you love doing. And I want everyone here to think about how you can use what you love doing for the Lord. What is it? You see, he's gifted you and me differently. 
He's given us a skill set. No two skill sets are just alike. No two interest sets are just alike. God has made you a unique individual. Every mold was broken with each person here that was born. Every mold was broken. There's not another person like you. Well, I heard someone say once that it's best to give school teachers a break and not ask them to teach Sunday school. <laughs> but I found out that school teachers make great Sunday school teachers. Why? Because they love teaching. A group of men at one church love working on cars. In fact, they love working on cars so much that the church built a car garage for them to work on cars. And they take donations of cars and they fix them up for people who need them. What a ministry. Men doing what they love doing to help others. You know, maybe you can take food in your car to someone. We have several who take meals to people on Wednesday night. But that number could easily grow if you don't mind driving. If you love being kind and benevolent. Maybe you're friendly. We can use friendly people, can't we, Bill? Maybe you like to organize things. Uh, let me know. I got some things for you to organize right now. Maybe you like to talk on the phone. If, if you like talking on the phone, let me know. I have some calls you can make right now that will keep you busy for a long time. Or. Maybe it's time to try something new. Maybe you've not found that sweet spot that defines who you are in Christian ministry to others. I've been thinking about the refugees that come here for class each week, and they are learning English, but there is an obvious language barrier. It struck me this week while I was in my car that perhaps the language barrier is not their problem. Now. They're learning English, and I believe if they're going to be American citizens, they need to know English, and that our forms need to be in English, and I'm, I believe all that. But when they first get here, perhaps the language barrier is our problem, especially if we want to reach them for Christ. Maybe some of you can learn the basics of another language. Sure wouldn't hurt anything. How comforting it would be for someone to hear, hello, how are you, my name is in their own language when they get here from a country where they've been abused and exiled. Think if you were a stranger in a foreign land and you walked in a building and everyone just stared at you and then someone spoke to you in your own language. I think it was about a week and a half ago I walked to the Family Life Center one morning and I saw a group of these refugees waiting for their leader to, who, was, who went to get another van load of people, and they were sitting there very humbly and quiet like this. And so I said, hello, does anybody like to play pool? So I got a few pool sticks and some balls, and three men got up to shoot pool. And one man, I mean, he beat me. I, I could not believe people from the Middle East knew how to play pool. And I said, who taught you to play pool? And this man said, I from Afghanistan, American soldier, <laughs> taught me to play pool. But do you like to shoot pool? The whole purpose of recreation is to connect with people, to build relationships so that we can share the gospel. Can you come here on a Tuesday or Thursday around 845, shoot some pool with people? Could you do that? Could you play checkers? Could you just show up and be kind, but not just stare? Well, here's the application for individuals. Maybe you've been told something. Maybe you've been told these things that I'm about to tell you. Buckle up here for a minute or two because the ride might, not, might be bumpy, might not be very enjoyable. Maybe you've been told, you are no good. You can't do anything. You'll never be like your father or your mother or your brother or your sister. Maybe you've been told that you're worthless. 
Maybe you've been told that you bring nothing to the table. Maybe you've been beaten, tossed around, neglected, abused, put down, and shamed. Well, all of those things are lies from the pit of hell itself. Because you do count. You do matter. God has given you gifts that he's not given other people. Have you believed those lies? Confess it as sin and say, I'm not going to believe them anymore. Because you see, if Satan can make you believe that you are worthless, then he wins. Now, the statements that I just said are not only not true, we know that God loves us, but the truth of the matter is that God has a purpose for you, and if you are a believer, he has a ministry for you. He needs you to be a cog in the wheel there. He needs you to do something that reaches out to other people, that fills in that gap that's been missing, that only you can do. He'll use you to do it, or he'll raise up someone else to do it. He wants you to not focus on your weaknesses because you know what your weaknesses are already, but he wants you to focus on your strengths because in your weakness, you are strong according to the scripture. And most importantly, he wants you to take your strengths, your interests, what you love doing, and he wants you to use it to glorify him. Now, here's the application for the church. This week I read in the Baptist and Reflector about a church that thought it was dying because their Sunday morning Bible attendance was down. But after careful examination, <laughs> they realized that they were actually growing. They called in somebody to help them determine what to do and this helper helped them realize they were actually growing. They were involved in more ministries and reaching out to more people than they had ever done before. But you see, they were focusing on their weak area that was making them think they were dying. And I know of a, a church, I know of three churches actually, that went through a, a program called refocusing. And the whole program is expensive and it's misguided. Uh, but in, refocusing does not focus on strengths. Instead, it focuses on weaknesses of the church with the goal of shoring up those weaknesses. In all three cases that I know of where churches have used that model, it's ended up in an ugly witch hunt to look for the culprit that's causing the church not to grow. I think, the, I think it's gone away. I don't think any churches are using that model anymore. But how many times do we just focus on weaknesses? How many times in our family do we just focus on weaknesses? With our spouse, focus on weakness. With our children, focus on weaknesses. Why don't we focus on strengths and be aware of weaknesses? You know, I could put together a lecture for you on what a healthy church looks like. I could put charts together and say we should have a certain number in this age category, in this age category, and what the offering should be and so forth. And I could look at the downturn of numbers in the last year and we could easily focus on our weaknesses and we could turn all of our resources just toward our weaknesses. But let's not go down that road. Let's think about the things we do best and let's do them better. You see, we are, we are Tusculum Hills in a unique location with a unique demographic. We are not Forest Hills. We are not Brentwood Baptist. We're not First Baptist downtown. We are Tusculum Hills. And God has called us to this place at this time in a unique way to fill the mission that he has before us. And I'm challenging you as a church to focus on your strengths as an individual and then let's focus on our strengths as a church. Let's do what we do best and do them better.